also very much thank you for coming and thank you for having us. A um, bit of a, a <coughs> personal background, I used to be an engineer as an undergraduate, got a master's in it, and then I decided I was more interested in the historical side of engineering. So um, this is just a placeholder photo, but uh, the, the sort of big takeaway message for uh, the talk is I'm going to look at uh, a sort of shift in a movement in the 1960s and 1970s and a little bit into the 80s uh, called the Appropriate Technology Movement, which sort of failed in a way. Um, but as I will hopefully demonstrate, um, there are a number of really useful things that we can take away from it, and I think in the end, ultimately, some hope. Right? Um, so uh, this, this model here, that uh, is what to frame all of this for, uh, is to encourage any designer, whether that's an engineering designer, an industrial designer, a social designer, an interior designer, to remember that technology is not just machines. Technology is machines with people, because machines without people is junk or a scrap here. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many people here, at least under the age of 40, uh, have heard of the phrase, the uh, uh, appropriate technology movement? Appropriate technology. Okay, so relatively few. Any of those who put your hand up, do you actually consider yourself doing appropriate technology design? Yeah. The only person I know of on campus who actually uses this phrase, although he hasn't lately, is Joshua Pierce in his 3D printing group. He's, he's got a background in science, technology, studies, uh, and so I, I think I know why he uses it, although he's doing it in a slightly different way than what I'll talk about today. Um, so those uh, second and third and fourth lines there uh, are sort of the, the, the warnings, perhaps, that I want to uh, suggest as we go through this. Um, all of the things that I'll talk about, I, I sincerely believe, were very well-intentioned and are very good ideas, technologically speaking but all of them ran up against social and cultural problems that both in, uh, in America and uh, in uh, developing countries where they were trying to uh, install them, that ultimately, at least in, in, in the aggregate, uh, damned them so that they were ultimately immediately failures, although perhaps with a longer term view, we can help them. So uh, Google Engrams, I often find, is a good way to, to get a sense of when we're talking about things. Google is billions or trillions of books scanned. Uh, you can find out that if you look for appropriate technology, you can see it, it little, little teeny bits in the 60s, and about 73, 72, somewhere there, it just takes off like a rocket. This movement was a big and important movement for not quite 10 years, and then it sort of um, dribbles away for various reasons. It's partially replaced by other things. But what I want to look at is why this movement began in the first place, what it was trying to do, and some lessons that we can, in a positive way, learn from it, but then also some lessons that we can take away to make sure we don't do again, so that we don't have the good ideas it was trying to do uh, dwindle away this way. So typically, the, the uh, start of the, um, the movement is supposed to come from E.F. Schumacher's book, Small and Beautiful. Uh, he's an economist, British economist, who supposedly coined the term, although Google Engrams clearly shows the term was around before he, he used it. Uh, but he popularized it. And you'll notice the subtitle there, A Study of Economics as If People Mattered. Because what had happened by the early 1970s was that economists and engineers and development people had started behaving as if people didn't matter. Right? It was either economics, or it was efficiency, or it was throughput whatever it was, and people should just accept this. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. The other thing, which actually is a little more directly, sort of continually relevant for us, uh, in 77, Amory Lovins published this book called Soft Energy Paths, which was basically suggesting we need alternative forms of energy, which is a phrase we still hear a lot about today. But the better way to think about it is, it's a term we again hear a lot about today. It disappeared for quite a while in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and Lovins, if anybody's familiar with the Rocky Mountain Institute, with a lot of very good um, energy uh, modeling and alternative energy things, he's still associated. He's, I think, sort of an emeritus associate there. But that came out in 77. So uh, the 70s was really the shifting one, and appropriate technology was taking up the challenge. Um, the phrase uh, that was often um, sort of used to describe it was it was aimed at underdevelopment overseas and overdevelopment at home because alternative technology also criticized what we were doing. And here's what they said. This is from a modern article, but this is more or less their idea. On a whole series of axes, you can have any type of design you like. You can have small scale and decentralized, or very large scale centralized, you know, technocrats over there, and local participation. Alternative technology staked out its territory in the small scale, ecologically sound, craft-based, simple 
side of things. And it very clearly said we are an alternative to, and they argued a better alternative to, uh, the kind of large-scale dominant technologies that society was, was doing at the time. And so here, by the mid-70s, this is what they said um, appropriate technology, I'm sorry, I may have just said alternative. Appropriate technology was supposed to be cheap enough, simple enough, suitable for small scale, compatible for creativity, and this phrase, self-educative in environmental awareness. Well, what does this mean, okay? As they tried to implement this, uh, they, they ran up against larger questions, right? Who, who is the everyone that we want to be able to, to use this? So, D80 is a great example. It's that other 80% that the older designers, the large scale designers, had really never paid much attention to before. What infrastructure can you um, assume is actually there? And we've heard some of the talks this morning exactly uh, addressing this question. What, what should we build so that they can actually repair it and maintain it? By the way, that's also a cognitive inf infrastructure. Do they, for example, know how to uh, you know, rebuild a diesel engine if you want to install a diesel engine or something like that? Not just can they get oil filters. Uh, small scale things. Um, this one was pretty self-evident, but one thing the uh, appropriate technology movement didn't bet on was larger forces, namely big corporations, resisting this, saying, no, you, you can't have small scale because that would cut into our profits and all. Give you an example of that uh, in a little bit. Now, these last two, um, they're not so much a question directly related to the different first two, but um, what the appropriate technology people wanted to do was say, um, rather than just give technology that tells people what to do, give them technology that empowers them to do something makes them feel in control, allows them some creativity. Sarah mentioned the, the Damaxium partially failed because you really couldn't alter it. You, like literally, the outside skin is aluminum. You can't hang a picture because you just popped a hole through your wall to the outside. So it, it was not, it did not uh, fuel uh, needs for creativity. Um, and this one, because the 1970s, as you may know, was part of the, the environmental movement, uh, really took off. Uh, also with things like the energy crisis, the um, the appropriate technology people said, we, we want to make it very plain that what we're doing is what we would now call green. They didn't have a phrase that would Make sure that whatever we're proposing is clearly and transparently, in our terms, sustainable. Right? So, um, what were they responding to? Well, um, notice, as I said, this sort of takes off in the 1970s. Let me put this in the context of a different one, and this is uh, the idea of technocracy, that is, rule by technology. That's the engram. Uh, the, the vertical axis shifts a bit. I'll show you the comparison in a minute. But appropriate technology takes off in here. It lags this thing. So what was this movement that they were actually responding to? Well, the early phase, that 1930s phase, um, is an interesting one. And I, I would just sort of characterize that as the Buck Rogers future that Nikola Tesla, who was back here, promised us but didn't do anything, but we get it supposedly here. And that everything will be run by these scientific experts with uh, you know, radio and TV, with television and automatic radio phone. This is a 1930s illustration, so TV was still a dream. Uh, crewless ships controlled by radio, radio powered distributor. That is a Tesla idea from the uh, 1890s and things. It's going to be this wonderful sci fi future which technocrats would bring us. And technocracy was actually a movement, a political movement, a uh, sort of institution, a place, thing called Technocracy Inc. How to, how to, uh, manage society using technological scientific experts in order to do it. Well, this whole thing fell apart, and this is the best um, example I could find, uh, right, the pin man technocracy er, 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 collapsing in, in spider web, because the new, at least this political cartoon at the time claims the New Deal came along with huge public spending and sort of this idea faded away. Well, it didn't as much fade away as you might think, well, you know, there's the Depression, World War II is right in there. And then why does it come back later? Well, it's a different model or a different sort of thing in the 60s into the 70s. This is the image I want you to think about there. Right? So interstate highway systems, large-scale technologies, centralized planning, remember those axes, all the stuff that would be in the top quadrant um, from that previous set of axes. Um, and it, it's things like this. You, you want to have cars, you want to have cities for cars. Well, therefore, the engineer says we need highways, and we need, therefore, to put things through. And we say, we'll design it that way because for whatever reason, from this drive freeway, we want to get somewhere up that way. Um, uh, what, what about those neighborhoods you just bulldozed? Right? And this is what people were complaining about. People were not happy about this. Modern cartoon, right? But this is the technocratic idea of arrogant paternalism. Uh, we know what's good for you. Take it. This is for the best. 
<clears throat> some people liked it, some people didn't. But it shows up all over the place in the 50s and 60s. So everything from large-scale corporate uh, organization of everything, so the, 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 the uh, anonymous workers in a giant room, to NASA, right? A wonderful, fabulous thing, but couldn't have happened without massive, massive uh, technology, control, engineering, science, all that sort of stuff. Uh, computing itself, at that point, remember, we still don't have linear microcomputers, it's still a large-scale mainframe sort of thing. And then the two things, and this, this is what leads me back to uh, public technology, are housing projects. That happens to be French, but look at any major American city, and we know how well the projects worked, right? Uh, and at the other end, nuclear power and the anti-nuclear movement. These things together, uh, sort of came together, or rather the issues around these things came together to cause people in the 1970s to say, you know what, we need something different. We need a different sort of thing. So those are those various things. The other one I'll just mention here uh, is the counterculture movement. This is the era, the sort of um, peak of the era of the, the hippie generation, and that's going to be done for a minute. So, distrust of major things. So, here in America, there was a critique of uh, existing technology, and there was a whole movement to do small scale, low impact, uh, green as we would call it, technology. Things like the Whole Earth Catalog came out starting in 1968. It's kind of like, imagine the internet that only searched for green or environmental or sustainable stuff. But of course, it was a printed publication in um, And it did things like, you know, how to build, in this case, a sawmill out of, with a windmill. Or how to do a solar cooker at home. Those of you know who are, are know about sort of small scale design, these, these ideas are still there. Maybe not the wind powered sawmill. What's interesting, and this is the connection I'll give you from the historical thing is that this movement in the 70s for the wind-powered sawmill comes from a reprint of a book on Nebraska, the homemade windmills in Nebraska, which was an 1899 uh, ag extension uh, sort of survey of look at all the small-scale stuff that people had done before, in this case, Nebraska largely industrialized. So it was looking to older techniques, and that's the theme that I'm going to focus on. Um, and so as early as 1959, you get a group of people known as Volunteers in Technical Assistance, or VITA, um, coming together, uh, this is before the term appropriate technology was coined, um, but it was a bunch of GT engineers, so these were top of the line, uh, you know, good engineering school, en educated engineers, who said there's got to be solutions for, in, in this case, they were looking at the developing world, there's got to be solutions. And so things like solar cookers were their kind of um, poster gadget, poster child. Um, I can look at his name, I forget this guy, <coughs> GE engineer. In his spare time, he figures out a way to make a parabolic solar cooker, which technically works extremely well. They tried to uh, install some hundreds were installed in developing nations in Africa, and hundreds were virtually never used after the first time they were taken out of the box. Um, but Vita did a whole number of things. They looked at things like biomass and different types of uh, low head, low flow um, uh, hydropower. They published this thing called the Village Technology Handbook, which became a standard reference manual for Peace Corps volunteers going over and saying, oh, you need a better water pump. Take my handbook and it's got examples. And it's this idea of coming up with solutions for places, and it could be domestic or foreign, um, that need assistance, uh, which started taking off even in the early 60s under the technocratic thing. And the reason I want to point that out is that this was, not only was this fellow um, a GE employee, GE itself actually carved out a space in its research facility in Schenectady for the VITA offices. So it was actually kind of um, an outreach, if you like, of that um, corporate technocratic world. This was at the same time that the government was very explicitly doing direct outreach to um, developing countries through the Marshall Plan to give them modern Western technology. And as a side note, that was specifically so that Stalin didn't do the same thing, because he was trying to do the same thing. So it was an ideological war as well. Right? Eisenhower said uh, that we fear that the, underdevelop the underdevelopment in the third, what they called the third world then, would turn to false, the people would turn to false doctrines or hostile ideologies. So therefore, the U.S. should provide the technical assistance that is necessary to lay the groundwork for productive investment, production goods, machinery and equipment, and financial assistance in the creation of productive enterprises. The problem was that even installing these things in developing countries didn't always go so well. And so here's an article from 1963 that opens. It's ironic that science and technology have perhaps done more to complicate the problems of developing countries than to provide solutions. It didn't completely backfire, but not a lot of it worked. Uh, as planned. We're also some major, major screw-ups. Um, and this concern 
is already there in the technocratic world. Technology to advanced economies are generally geared to well-integrated, large-scale production requiring high capital outlay and large amounts of skilled labor. Developing economies call for small, efficient processing and assembly plants designed to function with modest transport and power facilities utilizing local materials and skills. If I use that bit, I could have you know, put that in front of any of the teams that have gone out today and say, we're still doing this, right? And it's absolutely true. So that's why appropriate technology rises about five, ten years later than that resurgence of technology. It's a critique of technocracy. It's a um, uh, sort of alternate path in a sort of complementary way, but also in a contradictory way. And that's the, the battle that's going to um, for, uh, force itself out. So let me give you a quote here from a fellow I'm going to mention in just a couple of slides. <coughs> a, French, a, a Frenchman who lives, lived in London at the time named Jean Guimpel. Quote, attempts to introduce sophisticated Western type technology have generally met with insuperable difficulties. When machines break down, there are not enough locally trained engineers to repair them. New factories are too highly mechanized, requiring trained workers, but only in very limited numbers. These factories actually increase the difficulties of third world countries. Their peasants in the villages are so poor that when they hear about the great new factories, they emigrate to the cities. There they find out that the factories are not able to employ them, and so their families increase in the numbers living in the shanty towns outside these cities increases exponentially. That was said in 1981, and he's actually a little late to the game. <coughs> so, um, here's what happens. Uh, maybe some of these people recognize these cultural factors. Um, and just zooming in on public technology, um, it rises very quickly. And what, at the very same time, this sort of idea that technology is really should be thought of as a socio technical system. It's a combination, right? Technology plus tools plus people um, starts to develop. So, here's where that comes from. Let me ask you questions. Your engineers, what's the most efficient way to dry your hands? <laughs> Your pants? Would be the answer. I mean, most engineers would probably say, well, paper has these qualities, and, and electrical dryers have these, and there's the, uh, there's the Dyson thing, right? High velocity, etc. I mean, pants is much closer to the truth. <laughs> Look for something that has no energy requirements except your own, no material requirements except your own, or the, in this case, the cloth you have on your body. Um, sort of takeaway message for this particular example, which I tied to tie to the bathroom. Um, you know, look to nature for solutions. Don't reinvent stuff or make more stuff. But how does nature do it? Right? So a second question. Right? What's the most efficient way to reduce air conditioning consumption? Live in the UP. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, it turns out planting trees is actually far more better, far more better, far better than uh, necessarily inventing a new, um, more efficient thing. So this is a specific case study, 1992, Sacramento Municipal, Municipal Utility District gave away shade trees to its customers because they calculated that for every four cents they spent on the trees, consumers would use about one kilowatt less <coughs> electricity, kilowatt hours, sorry, less electricity. So kilowatt hours an hour running about 12, 14 cents annually, and we're up in the 30s. 20, 20, 21, 23, locally. 20, okay, right, so if you, you can send, spend four cents a kilowatt hour to save that kilowatt hour, or just spend the 20 something, plant trees. So the point is, and this is what the alternative, or the appropriate technology people um, added into the thing, is that often the best design is actually not technical at all, it may be a social thing. And I could add to that, there's also the idea of a cultural fiction, which I get to in the discussion. So one last concept I want to add in here, which um, may or may not have heard of. Has anybody ever heard of the technological fix as a, as a proper term? This is an idea that was coined in 1990, sorry, 1966 in an article by this guy, Alvin Weinberg, who was director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, so the National Atomic Laboratory in Oak Ridge, part of the Manhattan Project. So no uh, counterculture or anything. Uh, in an article called, Can Technology Replace Social Engineering? And his answer was no. What we often do is we install technology as a technological fix, but in fact, um, although for him a technological fix was a brilliant thing, a way of shortcutting complex problems like a sword through a Gordian knot, in fact, what he, uh, he said was technological fixes, rather than solve problems, at best postponed them and at worst created new ones. Right? They are short-sighted, this is Weinberg, short-sighted expediency, if not downright immoral. Band-aid solutions when, in fact, you need some form of major surgery. Um, so here's that um, distinction, and, and this is the, this will give you the story of the uh, appropriate technology. The idea that um, technology is social plus tools, people plus tools, 
falls off, but the technological fix stays there. And the short version of my argument is that that technological fix argument was that the technocrats stayed in control. The alternative moved fell. I should point out, though, noticing if you look at Google Trends right lately, that one's falling precipitously. So maybe we are, in fact, in a happier <laughs> new regime. But that said, it's always appropriate technology. So I'm just encouraging you to revisit those ideas. So here's what they did. Between 1965 and 1980, they promoted all these various things. Right? Whole energy recycling. You're going to look at those and you're going to say, but we have all those. Right? Well, the point is we only recently have those things. Okay? This is the best example I can point to. President Carter, in 1977, I believe it was, 77, 78, installed solar panels on the White House roof. It was a typical thing that uh, appropriate technology people were saying you should do. He installed them. As soon as Reagan came into office, he ripped them out. Oh, uh, sorry, appropriate technology had gotten a name that was not something that the West, America, wanted to associate itself with. And so this is a 1993 um, uh, address to a bunch of historians of technology. These alternative appropriate technologies uh, themselves survived, but without an ideological context that gave them political meaning. So what happened? Let me give you a very, very quick thing with too many pictures of this fellow. He's a, uh, as I say, French-born, lived in London, uh, Nazi resistance fighter, so you know, positive uh, kudos there. Um, he wrote a couple of very important uh, books, but it's important to know he was sort of a semi-historian, not really that professional trained. He was a family of art dealers in Paris and in London. So he was really just a socialite who had very passionate, um, strong ideas. And what he did was, for example, this medieval machine book, where he looked back to where did technology in the West come from. He said the Middle Ages, then translated in all those of the English editions, translated in a bunch of ideas, including uh, languages, including Romanian, um, laid out this whole story of here's what the Middle Ages did. But then in the end, he says we should look back to that technology, those historic examples, to save ourselves now. The reviewer of this book says, quote, the epilogue, however, which offers overly simple comparison of the declining Middle Ages with the declining modern world, is, it be is best left unread. <laughs> to treat the medieval and the present eras as single entities in order to pluck out interesting little pieces as typical for comparison is to ignore the material, social, and ideological context, thereby making a historical understanding impossible. This didn't work, so he wrote more books, one on history of cathedrals. He wrote another book, Cult of Art, where he attacked the art world. That didn't go down so well. <laughs> and then in the early 80s, he wrote this book, which became in English, The End of the Future. And he was worried, you know, collapse of civilization, or at least decline of the West, I should say, is imminent. And what he said was, we need to use this low-tech technology from the Middle Ages and apply it to developing countries. And so he started this foundation called Models for Rural Development. Uh, and he wrote, this is another book that's in 79, this book, uh, the title is roughly The Middle Ages, What Are They For? And what Can We Do With Them? Um, where he uh, uh, promoted building models to show developing countries ways they can solve their problems without over doing over high tech. So here's, it, it's, uh, it's taken up very strongly by the UN and UNESCO and the World Bank. He, he had the sort of social capital and connections to get direct personal connections to people in the World Bank. So he starts going to places, in this case, someone showing uh, Romanian water wheel to, I believe, uh, South Asian uh, Sikh um, leader of how these things work. And the idea was this, if you just take them up, they don't need science, they don't need high-end theory, you can show them what an Archimedean screw looks like, ancient Greek idea, but hey, look, here you can raise water that way, here's how to build it. You can make little, frankly, kind of laughable children's diorama models to show, in this case, an integrated ecological agricultural system and other and say, you know, it's being used in these areas of works, why don't you try this? Other ones which are, I guess we'll say, just purely mechanical, uh, applying these things to um, whatever, in this case, raising water from a well with a chain pump, uh, and in this case, a horizontal uh, water wheel for grinding grain. The problem was, and this is the takeaway from the Gimpel story, is that the way he couched the story ultimately undid him. Because the technology is simple, it's robust, it's um, um, sustainable, it's, it's uh, repairable, et cetera, local materials, et cetera. But the way he presented it to the people, particularly in the developing world, didn't sit so well. 
So what he said was, this is a positive way, models being three-dimensional have the advantage over engineering drawings, often, often difficult to read by a non-specialist, and even being tactile over film, television, and all other audiovisual techniques. The non-specialist can understand the mechanisms by actually operating them. They fascinate the young as well as the adult and transcend language barriers. Fair enough, true. You can see how these things work. Um, in the end, though, what he starts doing is he starts judging. And he goes to these developing countries and says, not just that you don't need to know fluid dynamics in order to talk about water mills, but you can't understand that. So I'll let me get cut past that for you. He treats them like children. Right? In his, not so much as in, the, in his publications, but in his writings. Um, and he makes very clear judgments, right? So here's a case where he goes out, he's gone out to different places in the world, um, uh, right? The Romanian horizontal water wheel still in use in the 1970s, and over there a Nepalese one, right? The Romanian water wheel uh, is, uh, the construction techniques are perfected. Look, the Europeans got it right, even in the Middle Ages. So a thousand years ago, we were better than you are now. And let me give you this technology. And it was that cultural arrogance that ultimately damned him. So he's not a huge player in appropriate technology, but he's just a, another facet that doesn't get talked about much. But appropriate technology got shot down from both sides. On one hand, it was sort of too soft and too emotional about things, very feminized, as one historian has put it. And on the other hand, it's too um, sort of masculine or arrogant uh, in pushing attitudes, and in some cases, it's just downright racist. So some quotes. This is from that 1993 thing. Um, appropriate technology was a cowardly and self-indulgent indulgent refusal to embrace technological vanguardism as the finest expression of national virility. It sucks, in other words. On the other hand, you get attitudes, and this is in hell, since the African cannot comprehend modern scientific and technological theories. Not that they don't have good education, they're just incapable, right? White man's burden uh, run amok, uh, it's therefore our job to push it in. And so, you know, this, this, the alternative technology movement, not, again, just because of Gimpel, but because of others, um, got tarred in and, and put into the hippie category. And hippies are bad and dirty and possibly communist, so therefore, <laughs> we don't want them. And when, it's not Reagan himself, but when the Reagan um, revolution comes in and shifts in the 1980s, after Nixon, but Nixon was no fan of communism, as you know, um, anything that looked um, lefty or communal or low-tech was sort of um, screamed at until it went away. The other thing, though, is that a lot of uh, cases, and I couldn't think of a good example, but Ben and Jerry's is, is the sort of thing, um, some of the things where the alternative, sorry, appropriate technology that was doing the works just got co-opted and, and then was produced by the big companies. So it's not like they were completely ignored, but the ideas were shut down. And let me, bear with me on this one, this will make sense. Here's what happens in the 80s. Anybody ever see the original Rambo, First Blood? Okay. How does it differ from the second and the third ones? Those <laughs> Saves the world from the Russians. Sorry, saves America from the Russians, right? I believe rescues hostages for America, if I'm not mistaken. The best way to put this is a very, very damaged Vietnam veteran who's trying to hide out in an Oregon ravine and doesn't want to be part of society. But then, you know, shoot people for coming too close to him and then they have to, you know, haul him out. Rambo himself, the original one, was a huge critique of the whole military industrial complex, failure in Vietnam, uh, you know, um, strong national power, etc. but then got co-opted in the 80s. So that's 82, 85, and 89. Uh, and the shifting attitude is that appropriate technology just can't exist in a world with Rambo. And so, wonderful quote from a 1990-something article. It is difficult to imagine Rambo deliberately choosing to ride a bicycle or recycle his cartridges simply because such practices would be gentle on the earth. <laughs> so what do we do? I'm actually going to argue that we, we can sort of do it again, maybe not use the same terms. We're doing a lot of it anyway. But the failure of the appropriate technology movement actually, I think, gives us some lessons. Um, this is, a, if anybody's interested in the article, I can give it to you. It's a thing about social movements and the appropriate technology movement, suggesting why back in the 70s it failed. And if you look at the sort of scale effects and the content effects, these are various things that the appropriate technology movement tried. Right? They tried to have demonstration centers, and in some countries, Britain, for example, has some very good ones um, that become sort of showpieces of what they can do. 
They also have local grassroots organizing efforts and in some other places that works well, either by people being drawn to it or by promoting it. Um, but then at the top level, you may have some problems. So here's what happened. The demonstration centers in many places work well. The whole of catalog and, and the village technology handbook really worked well. Here's how we do it. And everybody agreed, this stuff works. In many cases, people bought into it in the 70s, just as they are today. But at least in the 70s, the problem was that the sort of advocacy and, and, and arguing for it both ran into a cultural problem and many of the people in the um, appropriate technology movement thought it would just be self-evident and people would just all rush to the bandwagon. More people rushed to the Rambo bandwagon, small-scale hydropower bandwagon. Um, and then ultimately, the big thing that, that this, our, this author points out is that the appropriate technology failed to enlist the support of basically the people who the power builders of the day. And they got either co-opted or squashed by the end. Right? So here's the, and this is, I'm very happy to put this in. This is what I was hearing this morning. Um, we started, the West started with, right, we know what you need, here it is. We got a little bit better, tell us what you want, then we'll design it. And, and that's what I'm hearing from, from students, and that's a great step, human centered design. But um, it's co-creation that some people are saying this is, this is better. So taking these steps, all the same, the first one is the same. These are from um, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful back in 1973. That this is the process of how you do it. And, and he was saying appropriate technology should go through this process. But it still assumed experts were going to do it for you, like the Vita people. Well, we're in many cases here where you know, we go to them and we ask, what do you want? But then we go away and we fix it. And then we go back to them and say, did this work? Is that good or not? Is it working? Solution. What people are pushing now is you, know, you need to be engaged the whole time. It's a, it's a tall order, but it is uh, uh, useful. And so if you're interested in this history, uh, 2012 book, Engineers for Change, um, does a really nice job of explaining how the, pro uh, the uh, industry, profession of engineering was sort of torn apart, conflicted by this. This is the description of, of this book. It addresses deep -seated, the deep-seated assumption about technology in American life by revisiting a moment when engineers were at war with their ideals. Between 1964 and 74, a rift about the purposes of engineering and the nature of technology opened within the profession, sparked by a combination of changes in the organization, content and scale of engineering labor, and by a trenchant critique of technology from intellectuals, activists, and everyday people. The most significant outcome of this crisis was how, largely in reaction to the alternative futures of reformers, engineers adopted a powerful vision of an aut autonomous technological change, that is, technology is what drives it, it's not really sort of even under our own control, that continues to shape the profession and indeed the majority of Americans' encounters with the human built world. So, did the uh, appropriate technology movement fail? In certain ways, yes, but it's still alive in a lot of the stuff that you're doing uh, as you go into uh, particularly rural villages, but we argue even in developed areas as well. Thank you very much.